عبد الله هتحط لنا اللينك على الصفحه اه يا اول ما دكتور احمد يشيره لنا خلاص وصل لي طب زي الفل So we are live now, okay? Great. Okay. We are live now. Yeah, yeah. On YouTube and on Facebook. Okay. Great. Welcome, my dear friends from all over the world. We will start our online webinar about COVID-19 in a few minutes. Follow us. Our webinar will be conducted over three days, today and tomorrow and after tomorrow. It will include eight lectures that will cover all important items as regard COVID-19. Today we will have three lectures, tomorrow we will have three lectures and Sunday we will have two lectures. Every lecture will last for about 20 minutes, followed by five to 10 minutes discussion. Dr. Abdullah Al-Maghrabi will collect the questions and we will answer the questions at the end of every lecture. We have eight speakers from six countries. So it will be an international meeting that will help us to know the different experience from different countries as regard management of COVID-19 patients. And we will do our best to, to record these lectures to be available for everyone later on. We will start in two minutes with lecture that will be presented by Dr. Ahmad Zahra, lecturer of critical care medicine in Kafr Sheikh University. And he will talk about 
ICU management of COVID-19 patients. I think it will be very interesting lectures and we will enjoy his excellent presentation. Are you ready, dear Dr. Ahmed? I am ready, Dr. Ahmed. Great, let's start, please. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is Ahmed Zahra, lecturer of critical care medicine at Kafr al Sheikh University from Egypt. Uh, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee for this opportunity to give this lecture. My lecture is about ICU management of COVID-19 patients mainly in ICU. I will talk about COVID-19 and short summary and its management and the Egyptian protocol and the finally take home message. We have no conflict of interest about coronavirus. COVID-19 is the third coronavirus infection in two decades that was originally described in Asia after SARS and MERS. Mm -hmm. This is slideshow uh, pathogenesis of uh, SARS-CoV-19 infection by direct viral tissue invasion to lung and the heart, causing hypoxia and myocardial injury, and by abnormal host immune response by uh, cytokine storm by interleukin-6 cause sympathetic hyperactivity, cardiomyocyte eye change, and inhibition to cytochrome B45. With using antiviral and antimicrobial drugs, leads to QT interval prolongation and might lead to ventricular arrhythmia. Management. General measurements using isolation, negative pressure room, using personal protective in, uh, equipment, closely monitoring to vital signs and labs, and should be to be alert about secondary infection, mainly in immune compromised patients. Uh, this monomers that you uh, generally use in ICU uh, about fast hug, uh, fast hugs by ID, feeding, analgesia, sedation, thromboprophylaxis, head up position, ulcerative prophylaxis, glycemic control, spontaneous freezing trials. Uh, PID, bowel care, and dwelling castor removal, discalation of antibiotics. ICU management. According to Gatunoni uh, group classification of lung pathology, as there are two types, type L and type H. Type L contains low elasticity. Me, dear Dr. Ahmed, can you raise your voice, please? Okay. Thank you. This is all right? This is good? Okay, great. Uh, this Very is slide good. show. Okay. Um, according to Gatunoni group, there are two uh, pathology of lung pathology type L and type H. Type L uh, consists of low elasticity, low ventilation, perfusion mismatch, and the low lung weight and the low equitability. Uh, type H uh, consists of high elasticity, high right to li left shunt, high light weight, lung weight, and high equitability. Same like severe ARDS and type L looks like high attitude uh, syndrome. In the early stage, we use non-invasive support by using a high flow nasal cannula and CPAP mask, non-invasive. Uh, early, we can use intubation, early intubation to guard against late emer and emergency intubation. According to surviving uh, sepsis campaign, the ventilation strategy, 
how to deal with COVID patient with hypoxia. If, is, uh, if this patient is indicated for endotracheal tube, do it urgently with using uh, non-protective uh, personal equipment. Try to uh, use video laryngoscope and minimize stuff in the room. If the patient is not indicated for endotracheal intubation, try to use uh, supplement oxygen. First, we are using uh, oxygen mask with five liter oxygen. If the patient is not tolerating, we can use a high uh, frequency nasal cannula if, if it is available, if it is available. If, uh, if it is not available, we can use a trial of non-invasive CPAP, um, but we are using, um, not uh, recommend using non-invasive uh, CPAP because aerosolar uh, transmission of infection. Uh, when the patient needs for in, uh, in, uh, endotracheal intubation, uh, classified with uh, mild or moderate uh, severe ARDS, the patient, if the patient uh, COVID-19 with mild ARDS, put the uh, tidal volume on four to eight milligram per kg and monitor uh, plateau pressure if it below 30, uh, keep it below 30 centimeter water do an investigation for uh, bacterial infection and uh, try to keep uh, oxygen saturation between 92 to 96. If the patient with moderate or severe ARDS consider higher PEEP, we can use neuromuscular agents, uh, try to uh, give a chance for recruitment and prone position up to uh, 60, 60 hours. Uh, refractory hypoxemia consider focused echo to exclude cardiogenic and right heart failure. If the patient is uh, refractory hypoxic, also we can check for endotracheal tube for obstruction and the pneumothorax, bronchospasm, and so on. Investigation in ICU, uh, PCR we, uh, may be negative in first uh, and the second uh, test try to make it every uh, 72 hours. The CBC was differential, mainly on lymphopenia, uh, concentration on lymphopenia, and with ESR, ferritin, creatinine, AST, ALT. Uh, imaging, mainly all the patients, we do a daily CT chest and the echocardiography and abdominal ultrasound if needed. Diagnostic testing according to surviving sepsis campaign is uh, of weak recommendation and of low quality evidence can obtain lower respiratory tract uh, samples and we can uh, do endotracheal aspirate uh, above yeah, any better than bronchoalveolar uh, samples. Fluid management, it is important uh, item, fluid balance with fluid restriction policy makes the patient net balance or slightly negative, use crystalloids only, do not use the straws or uh, synthetic colloids. Uh, we can use albumin if the level of albumin is below two gram per deciliter. Anticoagulation, uh, if the patient in ICU, all the patient, sorry, uh, all the patient in ICU uh, is on prophylactic mo low molecular weight heparin and oxyparin. Uh, 40 milligram uh, per uh, per day uh, if the, as a ventilator bundle. Uh, if the patient uh, did die more than 1,000, we can use a therapeutic, therapeutic dose, one milligram per kg every 12 hour. And the patient with acute renal failure, we can shift to heparin. According to the NHS society, uh, classify D dimer from uh, below 1,000, 1,000 to 3,000, and above 3,000. Below 1,000, we can give a uh, prophylactic anoxaparin according to the party weight. And from 1,000 to 3,000, we can use it as therapeutic. Above 300, we can, it is an apparel, 175 units per kg once a day. We can use hemodynamic monitors. We are also using uh, static parameters in Egypt, uh, but we recommend using uh, dynamic parameters like uh, 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 capillary like filling time, serum lactate, uh, pulse volume variation, uh, stroke volume variation over static parameters, uh, same like CVP.
vaso agents if the patient uh, developed the severe uh, sepsis or septic shock we can use uh, norepinephrine as first line of treatment if norepinephrine not available we can use uh, vasopressin or norepinephrine or the, of the patient uh, also not uh, if the target main arterial blood pressure cannot be achieved because you, we can use norepinephrine as we know we against use of dopamine if, uh, if norepinephrine is not available the patient with cardiac dysfunction and the resistant hypoperfusion, we can adding uh, we can add uh, dopamine. In refractory septic shock, we can use a low dose of corticosteroids, the same like 50 milligram uh, Q6. COVID-19 medical treatment, uh, we have hyperimmunity like immunoglobulin, passive immunity like convalescent plasma, hydroxychloroquine, fibrivir retronavir, map, steroids, anticoagulation. Egyptian protocol, uh, uh, guidelines of using hydroxychloroquine as a chemo prophylaxis for healthcare worker. Inclusion, inclusion criteria, asymptomatic healthcare worker exposed to suspected or confirmed cases. Can we use those of 400 milligram twice per day in day one? After one week, we can use 400 milligram uh, as long as the exposure period. COVID, we classify the patient of COVID-19 to asymptomatic patient and to mild to moderate and severe cases. Asymptomatic patients, we can give uh, uh, oseltamivir uh, 75 milligram every uh, 12 hours for five days and ascorbic acid 500 milligram every 12 uh, hours, cyanocovalamine once a daily as an immunity poster. COVID-19 patients with mild to moderate uh, symptomatic, uh, mm -hmm. same like uh, upper respiratory tract infection. Uh, for antipyretic, we, we give paracetamol IV, 500 milligram uh, Q6 hours, hydroxychloroquine, 500 milligram every 12 hours, with close monitoring of liver and kidney functions, and also ECG. Azithromycin, one gram first day, then 500 milligram per day for three days, or we can use clarithromycin 500 milligram every 12 hours for seven or uh, up to 14 days. Seltamivir 150 milligram every 12 hours for five days. Ascorbic acid and cyanocopolamine. COVID-19 patient uh, with lower respiratory tract. Also, we can use the same management plus uh, sepsis or septic shock treatment protocol according to surviving sepsis campaign. Management of other complications, same like uh, myocarditis, limit IV fluids, monitor fluid balance using anti failure uh, measurements like uh, dobetamine, nitroglycerin, milirinone, if uh, the patient is also hypoperfused or uh, hypotensive. We can intubate the patient if, it, if not already ventilated or intubated. We can use other mechanical circulatory support, uh, same like intra-aortic balloon dilatation, lower uh, intra-aortic balloon counterpulsation. And also we can use uh, veno, arterial, ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. Uh, second complications, uh, uh, acute kidney injury, mainly fluid management to op optimize fluid uh, status, try using dynamic parameters, not static parameters. Let's start with furizimide, uh, 10 milligram bolus, and escalate to infusion range from 5 to 40 milligram per hour to maintain diuresis. Hemodialysis, if there's no response, if the patient uh, hemodynamically unstable, can use uh, continuous, uh, uh, continuous replacement uh, therapy. Patient, how to, يعني, when patient to, to be discharged, if the body temperature remains normal for at least uh, three, three days, respiratory symptoms are significantly improved. Uh, C CRP uh, more than two times negative. Lung imaging show improvement in lesions. There is no com comorbidity or complication was required hospitalization. The saturation, oxygen saturation, more than 93% without assisted oxygen inhalation. This is charge approved by multidisciplinary medical team. Take home message. 
protect yourself and prevent spreading of disease, wash your hands with alcohol-based sanitizer or with soap and water. Keep distance at least one meter between yourself and uh, anyone who cough or sneeze. Try you, uh, your best not to touch your eyes, and your nose, your mouth. Cover your mouth and your nose with your bent elbow or tissue with cough or when coughing. Seek medical attention if you have difficulty breathing and high fever. Follow the directions of your national or local health authorities. Thank you. Thank you so much, Hello. dear Dr. Ahmed. Uh, excellent presentation. And uh, now we can allow uh, the questions from the audience. Dr. Abdullah. Yes, I'm following the audience and uh, still there is no questions from the audience, but I have a question uh, about uh, uh, thromboprophylaxis. Okay. Is it, is it, is it uh, uh, based on uh, patient by patient or uh, just uh, as prophylaxis for every patient or you give a therapeutic uh, anticoagulation? Uh, we use all uh, all the patient according to ventilator bundle uh, um, policy. We can give uh, a prophylactic anticoagulation for uh, ICU patients on. Uh, according to uh, NHS and um, updated guidelines, we can use uh, therapeutic anticoagulation, FD dimer more than 1,000. Uh, it is based on a clinical uh, sense. Uh, we, we got the patient uh, suddenly a hypoxic, same like pic picture, same like pulmonary embolism. So I recommend for all patient uh, D-dimer for uh, more than 1,000, we can give therapeutic anticoagulation. And all the patients of ICU should take uh, prophylactic uh, anticoagulation if there is no contraindication. Okay, another I have question. question yeah, I have a question from Dr. El Farhi. Uh, he is saying, why are you using hydrochloro in asymptomatic healthcare workers only? Uh, there is no evidence, but, but we uh, we yes. give. Uh, there is no evidence. So, uh, also, we uh, give a chance to to make uh, to to give. Uh, 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 to give uh, confidence to the medical uh, to health worker to work with the, with, with these patients, uh, how yeah how to protect themselves uh, by just uh, uh, to keep uh, confidence, not more. And there is no evidence for uh, using hydroxychloroquine also in uh, COVID nineteen patients. Okay. Uh, can I ask a question about uh, the ventilator setting uh, in patients with severe respiratory distress? Do okay. you follow uh, ARDS uh, protocol or uh, with high PEEP uh, and low tidal volume? Or uh, do you think this, this protocol is not practical or not suitable for COVID-19 patients? Uh, as I talk, uh, there are two patients. We saw uh, the patient with type L, um, same like uh, normal compliance. Uh, we use uh, a normal ventilatory strategy, start with uh, four to eight milligram per kg with no high PEEP. Uh, the compliance is good. If the patient uh, develops severe ARDS or low compliance, we use a lung protective strategy. Uh, tidal volume range from four to six milligram per kg and using higher beep uh, FIE2 uh, divided on beep uh, try to make a P, P plateau P below 30 if the P plateau, uh, if a plateau pressure below 30 above 30 we can use uh, prone position and uh, neuromuscular blocker with sedation we can give inhaled nitric oxide and inhaled uh, epiprostinol is a variable and some trials gave mainly known as inhalation uh, if there is not available we can go uh, for ECMO Veno, vena, veno arterial ECMO or veno venous ECMO. Great. And there is uh, another uh, couple of questions. Uh, one of them uh, saying how, how one must manage a COPD exacerbation patient with COVID positive and nebulizers, steroids, 
another question is asking about the timing of giving steroids also. Uh, I will answer uh, uh, for the second question first. Uh, we can give corticosteroids only when the patient is uh, a refractory shock. That's to say it's a septic shock, uh, not responding to vasopressors. We can give uh, 50 milligram Q6, only corticosteroids. For uh, COPD uh, patient exacerbation, try to give uh, inhaled corticosteroids, not uh, to give systemic corticosteroids. Yes, this is very important. As this was a matter of debate, as steroids uh, weaken the, the, the immunity and make the patient is more susceptible for a infection exacerbation. So uh, I think you use steroids as a last resort uh, in patients with uh, cytokine storm and uh, refractory shock with no any other available option. Am I right? Yes, yes you are right, Dr. Ah. Great. Great. Another question about uh, the strategies of ventilation and the prone ventilation. Can okay. you illustrate? Illustrate. Okay. Uh, first of all, uh, uh, we use uh, pressure ventilation uh, for the patient with mild ARDS or with uh, the type L uh, who have mild ARDS, we can use pressure uh, ventilation. If the patient developed severe ARDS, we use a control, volume control, assisted control, uh, ventilation. Prone position, we do it for 12 hours, uh, put uh, three pillows over the patient chest, and we have uh, six person, person, the doctor on uh, the head of the patient to try to uh, fix the endotracheal tube. <laughs> And uh, uh, the three one, uh, three one, and the other put the patient on on his head. Uh, the proposition is um, important for uh, improving uh, secretions, improve the pressures. Mm -hmm. We have two pressures: alveolar and the transthoracic uh, pressure. Uh, tried, uh, trying to uh, perfuse the more uh, dorsal uh, dorsal than uh, ventral. Uh, and uh, we found the patient develop uh, we the patient develop uh, increasing in uh, oxygenation uh, um, dramatically great any other question dear dr abdullah yeah there is another question uh, regarding uh, uh, he's asking you do you consider the l and h classification of Gattinoni et al. Uh, I, this is uh, same like uh, mild, moderate ARDS patient. Uh, I found in my uh, my career uh, clinic, uh, I found the patient with uh, good compliance and the other patient with no uh, with uh, low compliance. Uh, low compliance, uh, the patient uh, not responding to uh, also to lung protective strategy also, and the patient going to uh, die. Uh, if the patient uh, have a good compliance, uh, I also they not need for invasive endotracheal intubation or mechanical ventilation. Yeah. Uh, I, I consider Gatunoni group is is uh, is better than uh, uh, other series. Um, we have, I saw a normal, uh, EC, a normal chest X-ray and CT with uh, happy hypoxic syndrome. The patient is not tachypneic and not tachycardic, but the saturation on the monitor is uh, about 70 or 75. And I saw also the patient is tachycardic, uh, hypo, uh, hypoxic, uh, uh, distressed, and uh, the compliance uh, of him uh, on the ventilator is very bad. Great. I think the patient is with happy hypoxic syndrome is the compliance is good. And uh, in the early stage, we can uh, do, do proning position without endotracheal intubation or without, without mechanical ventilation. It will, uh, uh, will uh, yeah, improve uh, his yeah, hypoxia will be improved. Yeah, yeah, this is actually was a question by Dr. Basma Ghanem. I was about to ask you about the a prone position, awake prone position to prevent the deterioration of the patient. Uh, um, Another uh, question from Dr. El Farhi. 
uh, asking about uh, do you do you uh, recommend high D-dimer uh, to follow the protocol of anticoagulation according to the value of D-dimer or it is just for COVID? Uh, for just for COVID, uh, patients, uh, as I, I, uh, I, I talked before, the patient, we found the patient sudden hypoxia was normal uh, presentation. Uh, all the patients, we, we used uh, prophylactic anticoagulation, but uh, I, I found uh, some patients, or many patients dying from sudden, uh, sudden uh, hypoxia, same like pulmonary embolism. So, so I should give a therapeutic uh, anticoagulation according to uh, D-dimer if uh, more than 1,000. Great. Uh, um, final uh, question. Mainly spe uh, specific for COVID patients, not for uh, yeah. aseptic patients. Yes. The last question is uh, by Dr. Heba al Gendi saying, what about thrombolytics in case of acute pulmonary embolism? Um, uh, there is no evidence for using thrombolytics. Uh, they main, mainly for uh, cytokine releasing uh, cytokine storm. Uh, uh, I do not uh, use it before. I don't really use it uh, thrombolytics before. As a, there is no evidence. Uh, we this may be the last choice we can give if the patient is not improving and he is in a cytokine storm. We can also use uh, teclozumab as, as anti-interleukin six. As a novel series, as the, there is no uh, there is a micro and vascular. Uh, uh, thrombosis occurs as uh, DIC uh, sepsis, as DIC sepsis induced uh, coagulation disorders. Yes. Yeah. Another question by Dr. Shadi here from uh, uh, the speakers uh, regarding VV ECMO for non-responding RDS and for uh, have any experience of IVIG in uh, COVID-related myocarditis. Uh, also, uh, um, we have uh, no evidence for IVIG, IVIG and COVID patient, and uh, in uh, Egyptian protocol, we not use it uh, before uh, IVIG. But uh, as uh, I, I, I recommend, we using uh, IVIG and the late septic shock. Uh, there is no uh, evidence, but we can use it. As we know that, that COVID-19 is uh, error on the trial, not uh, a definite treatment till now. So we can use everything uh, recommended. Uh, if the patient developed the myocarditis, that is to say is, is a patient to have cytokine storm. Cytokine storm, we cannot expect what can uh, happen. Yes. Uh, we lost all weapons. So try it uh, early as soon as possible. Yes. Any other question, dear Dr. Abdullah? No, I can't find any more. Okay, uh, thank you so much, dear Dr. Ahmed, for this elegant presentation. And we will move to the next speaker, Dr. Mariam Fathi, cardiology specialist in Saudi Arabia, Certification Board of Infection Control, Certified Professional in Healthcare Quality. And she will talk about infection control measures in COVID-19 era. Are you ready, dear Dr. Mariam? Yes. Okay. Let's start the bid. Share the screen now? Yes, excellent. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, today, inshallah, we will talk about the infection control uh, precautions uh, when we are dealing with uh, COVID-19 patients. This is the, the two main guidelines I have uh, I used in my presentation. Uh, coronavirus disease guidelines uh, uh, from Saudi Arabia and CDC guidelines, uh, Center for Disease Prevention and Control. First step when we uh, when we want to prevent infection uh, in healthcare facilities, we have to do early recognition and source control. So the patient is coming to your uh, hospital. First step, he should meet 
uh, a visual triage person or a visual triage uh, nurse and she should ask him about some um, uh, symptoms like fever, respiratory symptoms, and maybe history of exposure, um, uh, like being in uh, a high risk area or uh, uh, exposed to confirmed uh, COVID-19 patient. And then if your uh, answer is yes, she will uh, take you to a specific respiratory area or respiratory clinic or isolation room and if no, they can treat you as a regular patient. So this is the first stage in any hospital. It should be one, two triage persons since coming to the hospital. So this patient will not be exposed to all other patients or healthcare workers uh, during uh, being in the hospital. Just the patient has uh, symptoms of COVID-19 or a history of exposure, she will direct him or he will direct him directly to a respiratory uh, designated area. So any uh, other method for uh, source control and early recognition? Yes, uh, CDC, uh, CDC uh, advises for uh, what is called universal masking and universal source control. Universal source control is the source is a patient. We should advise any patient coming to the hospital to wear a mask, whether it's a surgical mask or a cloth mask when he is coming to the hospital. The universal masking is for healthcare workers so that any healthcare worker inside the hospital who ha uh, has direct uh, contact with patient should wear surgical mask all the shift. The surgical mask can be uh, used all the shift unless it will be wet um, or uh, torn or uh, soiled, can, can be changed, but otherwise he can keep the mask all the shift this is for healthcare workers with direct patient care. The second question, Halas, this patient now in a, a waiting uh, in a designated respiratory area. The second question will come to our mind, should we test for COVID-19 or not? And this is the decision of the treating physician. The treating physicians should take a decision according to clinical, radiological, or laboratory uh, investigations. And um, according to this uh, case definition, he should take the decision to take uh, investigation or to take swabbing for this patient or not. So we should go to the case definition. Case definition, we have suspected case definition and confirmed case definition. This case definition we are using in Saudi Arabia. The patient has clinical presentation of sudden onset of fever, cough, or shortness of breath. And in the last 14 days, he was uh, present in a high risk area or close physical contact uh, with COVID-19 patient or working in a healthcare facility. This is the first case definition, first suspected case definition, the patient coming with symptoms and in the last 14 days uh, contact with COVID-19 patient or uh, high risk area or working in a healthcare facility. The second case definition is any admitted adult patient with unexplained severe respiratory illness. Uh, severe, respira severe acute respiratory illness means this patient needs ICU admission or with severe pneumonia uh, or ARDS. So if the patient coming with uh, either of these uh, two case definition, the doctor should decide to take the swab for him. This case definition is you know, almost similar to the WHO case definition. But maybe the, the difference for the high risk uh, areas in the uh, different uh, different countries, and for the uh, second case definition is for any patient, not only adult patient with uh, SARI or severe acute respiratory illness. Some other countries have have uh, different uh, case definitions. Like in China, they add some uh, C uh, CBC, lymphopenia, or uh, radiological signs of CT uh, image. But here in Saudi Arabia, we are using this case definition. The, the confirmed case definition is that uh, suspected case definition. And the patient, we sent to him uh, a PCR for lab confirmation and the result coming positive for COVID-19. Um, what uh, is the pathway for patients with suspected or confirmed COVID-19? The patient with suspected COVID-19, when, when he came, uh, when he come to the hospital, we should take swab for him, uh, and then we will assess the patient clinically. 
if he is clinically needs ad, needs uh, admission so he is clinically stable we uh, sorry if he needs admission so he is not clinically stable we will admit to the hospital if the patient is clinically stable we can admit uh, for home isolation so whatever it's home isolation or hospital isolation we will wait for the result if the result was, uh, will be positive we will uh, keep him in the isolation and manage him as COVID-19 patient. If the result is negative, we will assess the patient. If this patient is already suspected before to, uh, uh, sus uh, exposed before to a confirmed case uh, of COVID-19, or this patient with high clinical suspicion, if yes, we have to take another swab to uh, confirm this patient is not COVID-19. So mm -hmm. if the result is negative and the patient is high clinical suspicion, we Uh, high clinical suspicion, we have to take another swab to confirm uh, for the uh, negative patient. If the patient is not uh, highly suspicious, we can stop at this stage. And the patient now is not a COVID-19 patient. We can stop and treat him as, another, uh, as a regular patient, and we can search for uh, other uh, differential diagnosis. Now the patient in isolation, uh, uh, in a hospital or home isolation, when we can discontinue this isolation for COVID-19 patient. <clears throat> the patient with confirmed COVID-19 case, if he is symptomatic, we should wait until at least 48 hours after being asymptomatic. And after being asymptomatic for at least 48 hours, we will take the PCR again for COVID-19. If it's positive, we repeat every 72 hours until becoming negative. We will repeat in uh, 24 hours. If it's already again negative, we will discontinue the isolation. If the patient is symptomatic, we will uh, take PCR every 72 hours until becoming negative. We will repeat in 24 hours becoming negative. We will discontinue the isolation. So whatever the patient with COVID-19, we will wait until be like asymptomatic. We will take PCR every 72 hours. If positive, we will repeat every 72 hours. If negative, we will um, repeat in 24 hours until become two negative results. We can discontinue the isolation. So the criteria is resolution of symptoms. And importantly, that resolution of fever should be without any uh, antipyretics and resolution of fever and respiratory symptoms and two negative PCR 24 hours apart. In CDC, we are not using this in Saudi Arabia, but in CDC, CDC there is non-taste based strategy, strategy for discontinuing uh, the isolation that at least uh, three days passed from recovery uh, of the patient resolutions of all symptoms and at least seven days from the first uh, symptom appeared. This they are using maybe because sometimes lack of PCR testing, but in Saudi Arabia, we are just depending on the PCR uh, testing strategy. And even in the CDC, they recommend the test-based strategy uh, over this non-test-based strategy. What are the samples we should take for the COVID-19 patient? Uh, we have upper respiratory sample or lower respiratory sample. Upper respiratory sample is nasopharyngeal swab. Lower respiratory sample can be tracheal aspirate, uh, bronchoidular lavage, or even sputum. And we should know that usually the virus is more concentrated in lower respiratory samples. But because it's not present in all patients, so we have to take nasopharyngeal swabs for patients, for all patients. And if you can take another uh, lower respiratory sample, it will enhance the diagnosis. Now we should uh, know the mode of transmission of the disease, so we can know how to uh, protect ourselves and the community from uh, transmission of this COVID-19. The current data suggests a person-to-person -person trans transmission most commonly happens during close exposure to a person infected uh, with with the virus uh, that cause COVID-19 primarily via respiratory droplets. So the main mode of transmission is droplet infection. What are the modes of transmission we have in the hospitals or in this patient? Maybe droplet contact or airborne. Droplet means when person is coughing, sneezing, or talking, he may produce some droplets, and these droplets, the other person 
can have the infection if these droplets come to the mucous membrane of the eyes, uh, nose, or mouth. For the contact uh, transmission, the contact transmission, usually the contact with the patient may be direct, uh, direct contact or indirect contact. Direct contact is by like our hands like this, we are direct contacting the patient. Indirect contact may be with the equipment uh, using with the patient like stethoscopes, sphygma manometer, and so on. The, th the third way of transmission is the airborne infection, and the airborne infection means these minor droplets or minute droplets of what is called aerosols, these aerosols usually suspended in the air. So if you breathe the air, you may got infected. What in COVID-19, it's mainly droplet infection. Contact with respiratory secretion may also um, cause infection if you contact the respiratory secretion and then you put your hands in your eyes, nose, or mouth. And airborne transmission is only restricted if you are doing aerosol generating procedures. Aerosol generating procedures like intubation, extubation, CPR, uh, suctioning, nebulization, all of these uh, uh, process may cause this minute droplets suspended in the air and we can breathe it. So what are the isolation precautions we, precautions we need when we are dealing with patients with COVID-19? We need contact and droplet precautions, mainly contact and droplet precaution while no aerosol generating procedure. And if uh, the patient has aerosol, we need to do any aerosol generating procedure for the patient, we should add the airborne precautions to uh, the contact precautions. And if you see here, it's in both of them, we have some standard precaution we should apply for them. Whatever it's contact and droplet or contact and airborne is usually here also standard precaution. So what are standard precautions? It's group of practices of infection control, assuming that any blood, body fluid secretion or excretion of the patient may be infectious. We don't know any patient is coming to us, so we usually take what is called standard precautions with any patient COVID-19 or not COVID-19. These standard precautions example for hand hygiene, PPE, use of PPE, which is personal protective equipment, safe injection practices, safe patient placement, and respiratory hygiene and cough etiquette. For COVID-19 especially, we are focusing on the three of the standard precautions, which are hand hygiene, PPE, and, and um, respiratory hygiene or cough etiquette. Hand hygiene. We usually um, telling that hand hygiene is not time consuming at all. It is the most common way of prevention of infection. So we have two methods of hand hygiene, either hand wash or hand rub. Uh, we can use either way of them, except if our hands are visibly soiled. If visibly soiled, we have to go to the sink and do hand hygiene, hand wash with soap and water. Otherwise, you can use whatever you want, hand rub or hand wash. And you have to follow these steps when you are doing hand rub or hand wash. After taking this uh, hand gel, you have to do palm to palm, palm to dorsum with finger interlaced and vice versa, palm to palm with finger interlaced, interlocking fingers and rubbing, uh, rotational movement of both thumbs, and finally your fingers, uh, collapsed fingers or against the other palm. After your hand dries, after 20 to 30, around 20 to 30 seconds, and the hand dries, your hands are now uh, clean, uh, considered clean. Hand wash with soap and water, the same steps, but there is here some uh, more issues like water, soap, and uh, tissues. So first thing, you will rent, uh, uh, wet your hands with water, put the uh, soap, and then do the same steps. And after this, you will rinse your hand and dry them with disposable tissue and close the faucet with uh, the disposable tissue because you already opened the uh, faucet with your hands when it, uh, it was contaminated. So now you have to close it with your uh, disposable tissue. Uh, after drying, your hands are clean. Personal protective equipment. <clears throat> The recommended uh, personal protective equipment when we are dealing with uh, COVID-19 is gown, mask, goggles, or face shield, and gloves. And the sequence of donning or sequence of wearing, donning equal wearing, is first thing is gloves, is gown, second thing is mask, third thing is goggles or face shield, and last thing is your gloves. So from below, upward, and last thing is your gloves, gown, mask, goggles, and last thing is your gloves. 
before you don your PPE or you wear your PPE, you should do hand hygiene. And there is also a sequence for donning or removal of your PPE. It's the opposite sequence from donning except for your mask. So first you will remove your gloves. Second, you will uh, remove your face shield or goggles. Third, you will remove your gown and you will remove last your mask or respirator. Why mask or respirator? We postpone to the last because when you are dealing with a patient, you can remove your all PPE by the door of the patient room, except for your mask, you have to leave the patient room before uh, removing your mask. While, seek, while removing of your PPE, you should not contaminate yourself and you should do hand hygiene after each step of removal of your PPE. Third uh, one uh, for uh, standard precaution is the respiratory hygiene or cough etiquette. Usually when you are cough or sneeze, you are producing droplets. So if you, you, if you, you should cover your cough or sneeze, so you will not contaminate the surfaces around you or the persons around you. So either to use a tissue to cover your sneeze or cough and then do hand hygiene, or you should, uh, if you don't have tissue, you can uh, cough or sneeze in your sleeve or on, in your elbow. And this is the persons who are coughing or sneezing, they are the, uh, spreading droplets everywhere. This person is doing coughing or sneezing in her hands. This is prohibited also, why? Because you will use your hands everywhere to touch others, to touch uh, uh, so any, any surface. And so you should not uh, contaminate your hands and then use it again. So either you should use the tissue and discard after use or cough or sneeze in your the, now we finished the standard precautions, we will go now for the transmission-based precautions. For the transmission-based precautions, we have uh, the same transmission, contact droplet and airborne. So for the contact, we know how contact transmission occurs. So the main issues when we are doing contact precautions, we have to wear our uh, gloves and gown. Why? Because we may touch the patient with our body or with our hands. So if we Wearing, uh, wearing our uh, gown and gloves, so we are protecting our body and our uh, hands. Uh, the second thing that we should use dedicated equipment, because also equipment can be uh, indirect transmission for organism. So we should uh, use dedicated equipment like a disposable stethoscope or designated sphygmomanometer with this patient and not use uh, to other with other patients except after this infection. The second way for uh, trans, uh, the second uh, uh, type of precautions is droplet precautions. Droplet precautions, I told you that droplet transmission, the patient cough or sneeze droplets, and you will receive it through your mucous membranes of your nose, mouth, and sometimes eyes. So if you cover your nose, mouth, and eyes, you are protected, inshallah. You will cover your nose and mouth with a surgical mask, and you can cover your eyes with the goggles or face sheet. For the airborne precautions, uh, this airborne, the infection of organisms are suspended in the air uh, in these minor uh, droplets. So you should wear like a filter, which is called N95 respirator. You will wear it so it will filterize the air coming, uh, contaminated air coming to you before you can breathe it. Uh, and, but and when you are wearing N95, you have to know these issues. You have to do first thing what is called fit test. Fit test because we have many different uh, respirators, uh, N95 mask. We have different sizes and different types. So each one of us may be fit to uh, a different, uh, yeah, certain type or size, according to the shape and size of his face. So you should do the fit test first to know your size and type. What suits you? Then every time you are using, you have to uh, inspect this mask for structural integrity and for soiling. And then to do seal check every time you are wearing. Uh, what is seal check? Seal check that you are confirming that there is no air is coming except through your mask. So you will do deep inhalation or deep inspiration and deep expiration. According to the type of mask, deep inspiration may will make, if the mask is fit to you, will make like suction of the mask and deep expiration will blow the mask and the no air will come uh, between the mask and your skin. So now every time you are wearing, you should uh, see, check the mask 
and do seal check before using. Unless this, you, do, you did the first, unless you do the fit test, you inspect and you do the seal check every time you may wear your N95 without any protection. If you need necessary procedures, usually the rule is avoid movement or transport of the patient out of the isolation room, except if medical necessary, if medically necessary. Uh, so if you need x-ray, ultrasound, echocardiography, anything like this, you can use a portable machine to come into the patient room and then you can disinfect this machine after finish with the patient. So you will not transfer the patient through the hospital corridors, every area to be um, exposed to all patients and healthcare workers. You will just do inside the patient room. If there is any procedure that is necessary, you have to transfer the patient, like CT, for example. You uh, should uh, do some precautions. First, you have to inform the receiving department, uh, because this receiving department should um, take their precautions also. The second, uh, second thing that there is something called isolation transfer cards, that the, all the precautions for transfers are written on it. And you can take with you because anyone will meet you, uh, will know this patient needs these precautions. And after you finish with the patient, you should uh, disinfect uh, the wheelchair or uh, trolley taking the patient, and you should do hand hygiene. For each type of transfer, we have some uh, trans trans transfer precautions. For the contact precautions, mainly you have to do the hand hygiene, you have to uh, dress the patient with clean gown and uh, cover the patient with clean linen and you have to uh, wear your gloves. For the uh, droplet transfer, you have to uh, tell the patient to wear a surgical mask if he can tolerate it. If he, ca if he can tolerate it, you, he can uh, just do the high uh, the respiratory hygiene or cough etiquette. You can give him a tissue uh, to cover his cough or sneeze. And uh, for the healthcare worker, if the patient can tolerate also, he should wear the uh, surgical mask. For the airborne precaution, the patient uh, should wear also surgical mask or at least cough etiquette. And the healthcare workers, if the patient can tolerate the mask, should wear a N95 mask. So during the transfer, the CDC recommends that you have to inform the receiving department you should wear all your PPE, gown and gloves, face shield and goggles, and masks or respirator. And then after finish, you have to disinfect the surfaces or the machines, all machines, and then to do hand hygiene. If the patient needs any emergency surgical procedure, also the rule is don't yani, postpone any procedure until the patient becoming negative and except for emergency procedures. Emergency, emergency procedure you have to do, so make it last of the list if applicable. If the patient is too much emergency, you have to, you can send the patient anytime. Minimize the staff and the traffic inside the OR. Use HEPA filter inside the OR. Use the N95 mask in, in, instead of the surgical mask. Why? Because you are doing many aerosol generating procedures like intubation, extubation inside the OR. Um, patient should recover in the same OR theater, not taking the patient to the general recovery area. Then proper terminal cleaning should be done by the housekeeping after the patient uh, will be discharged from the OR and the proper disinfection by uh, uh, anesthesia technician for the anesthesia machines. Last uh, uh, part of my lecture is about what if a healthcare worker exposed to COVID-19 uh, patients. There is two types of exposure. It's the first one is high risk unprotected exposure. So, so the patient high risk why? Because he is near to the patient within 1.5 to 2 meters, and this pe person is unprotected during this exposure. Unprotected means he is not wearing his PPE at all, or not wearing the surgical mask at least, or sometimes maybe during aerosol generating procedures, this person is not wearing his N95 respirator or face shield during aerosol generating procedures. All of these are uh, exp um, considered high, uh, un high risk unprotected exposures. What should we do for these uh, healthcare workers with high risk unprotected exposure? First test for COVID-19, even if this healthcare worker is uh, asymptomatic, 
uh, repeat this test again for symptomatic case and exclude from work for 14 days. The other uh, types of uh, exposure for healthcare worker is the low risk. Low risk means uh, you are away from the patient, maybe two meters or more away, just you may enter the patient room and coming out like this. Or protected exposure. You are near to the patient, but you are fully protected. You have wearing all your PPE. So these persons are considered very low risk. And so we will not test for COVID-19 uh, unless the, this healthcare worker is symptomatic. Uh, when this patient, person is asymptomatic, no need for restriction from work, just they should assess uh, their symptoms daily, twice daily, for 14 days. If there is any symptoms, they have to stop work immediately and ask for medical help or for start. So we use this, something like this, which is called logbook for exposure. Uh, why the patient in the isolation room, we will write the patient name and room number, and we will write everyone, every healthcare worker is going to the patient room, and the duration of exposure, the distance between the patient and the healthcare worker, used, he used uh, gown, gloves, which type of mask or face shield, and if there is any aerosol generating procedure is done. So everyone is coming through the patient, uh, to the patient, he will uh, record his name and what he used. Because if this patient uh, coming positive, is a suspected patient coming positive, we should assess the patient, the healthcare workers, according to this uh, log. When uh, these healthcare, healthcare workers considered, uh, who are test initially positive, consider the clear when, if these uh, uh, healthcare workers are asymptomatic for at least 48 hours, this is in Saudi Arabia, in, in CDC is just asymptomatic, and the observation period is finished, 14 days post exposure, and has two, at least two negative PCR tests. And thank you. Thank you so much, dear Dr. Mariam, for this elegant presentation. <clears throat> Actually, it covered uh, all uh, our questions about the infection control process. I have uh, one question. Uh, do you think that the healthcare uh, provider, if he was in contact with the COVID positive patients and he was wearing the personal protective equipment and he is totally asymptomatic, after he finished his work, let's say for two successive uh, weeks, can he go home or he must isolate himself for another two weeks for observation of any symptoms? I think here in Egypt, uh, the protocol is to work for two successive weeks and to isolate yourself for another two successive weeks. What do you think about this protocol? Well, I think this protocol, if applicable, it's good. Why? Because if you are exposed for two weeks, you will be isolated for another two weeks. So if any symptoms will happen, you will uh, be not exposed to any other healthcare worker or even patients during these two weeks. But it's maybe not applicable in all hospitals. Some hospitals have, uh, yani don't have this much stuff to do like this. It's not recommended in CDC or in MOH in Saudi Arabia, but some hospitals uh, doing these issues, it's it's good if, if you can apply it. Great. Uh, another question, please. Uh, uh, what is uh, the, the, the difference between the surgical mask and um, the homemade mask as regard uh, efficacy? Uh, we, I have read that uh, the CDC recommend even the homemade mask uh, for the public. Uh, it it uh, can delay the spread of infection, but it can't prevent the, the infection. What about the comparative efficacy between the homemade mask, surgical mask, and N95 mask? Okay. Um, for homemade mask or cloth mask, it's recommended by CDC that public can wear in in general areas, or if it's if it's not available too much surgical mask inside the hospital for source control, they can also wear this uh, public. They can wear this uh, cloth mask, but its efficacy is not uh, yani proved. Just this is a barrier between you and the others, so it will cover your nose and mouth. It will contain your droplets like this, but it's not proved efficacy. No studies. Uh, 
on this uh, type of mask, this cloth mask. For you the surgical mask, uh, better than nothing. Yes, yes, it's better than nothing. Nothing, but it's it's uh, it's for just public. For maybe also in hospitals, these clerical clerks working in offices, they can use like this. It's okay. But for the healthcare worker uh, doing uh, direct care to the patients, it's not recommended. Only the surgical mask or N95. N95 only during aerosol generating procedures and uh, a surgical mask maybe during any patient contact uh, during the shift or even with COVID-19 without aerosol generating procedures. Great. Do you think that the frontliners, our physician in the ER, should mask N95? No, 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 at all. There is no evidence in whatever, no, no recommendation from CDC, WHO, or side UMH to wear N95 all the time, even if you are a frontliner. Just if you are making aerosol generating procedures, because also you have to see uh, the supply you have. If you use N95 without any indication with all patients, you will at some at certain time you will not find N95 anymore. So just you should wear your surgical mask. It will be protecting you, inshallah, according to the current data, fully protection for you, except if in aerosol generating procedures. Great, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Abdullah Magrabi. Uh, please uh, share with us uh, the questions from the audience. Yeah, there is uh, a couple of questions from the audience. So the first one, Dr. Tansit, he's saying that in the UK, they are saying if exposed, no need for testing. If symptomatic, isolate. If not symptomatic, carry on work. Is this logic? Um, according, according, according to MOH Saudi Arabia and according to CDC, if you hire, if you are at high risk exposure, unprotected you are uh, likely to have uh, get infected from the patient. So you have to take sample and to uh, isolate for 14 days, uh, even if you are asymptomatic. But if the, the exposure is low risk and uh, protected exposure, so it's unlikely that you are infected. So you can uh, just complete your work, if, except if you are symptomatic, like he said in UK. But if high risk uh, exposure, unprotected exposure, it's a must in, in us, in our uh, policies, to uh, stop uh, restricted from work for 14 days and get testing. Okay, another question is saying after recovery from COVID-19 illness and discharge, when the patient can return back to work and engage with others? Um, in patient in, in MOH guidelines, Saudi Arabia, if the patient is discharged after we clear, hit, clear him after two negative uh, PCR, we are uh, discharged or discontinuous isolation, but we advise for 14, again, 14, more 14 days for uh, home isolation uh, after discharge from the hospital. Okay, a final question about the mask. One, one, one question about N95 mask, can we use it over three hours in the red zone? Another one about surgical mask for more than four, four hours, if there is no other choice, is it okay? Yes, there is, there is um, um, advice from CDC, you can use a surgical mask, uh, all the shift, all your shift, all the time, the same surgical mask, except is, is if you become wet, soiled or torn, you have to change. But otherwise, if you are in the same clinical area, you can use the uh, surgical mask for many hours, no problem. Um, for the N95 also, there is uh, some policies about uh, the extended use of N95. You can use the, the same N95 with many patients, except if you have any also contamination or splashes of your, you did any aerosol generating procedure, you are feeling of contamination, you can uh, change, but otherwise you can use for extended use with many patients also no problem. Great, thank you so much. Thank, thank you. you so much, dear Dr. Ramariam, for this uh, excellent lecture. And now we will move to the uh, last speaker today, Dr. Mohammed Noman, radiology consultant in Germany. And he will talk about role of chest imaging in diagnosis of COVID-19. Are you ready, dear Dr. Mohammed? Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Yes, I'm ready. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, uh, is now my, you are seeing my screen right now or I should, uh... We don't see your screen. We see I, okay. 
Okay, I have to to choose it from. How do I choose uh, to show my desktop? Uh... Share, share screen. Ah, okay, and share screen. Yes, okay. Now I yes. Uh, yes. You can see it now? Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Now I have to. Okay. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, thank you, every uh, uh, um, one, uh, for inviting me to uh, this uh, um, online event. Um, my lecture today will be the role of chest imaging in diagnosis of COVID 19. Uh, and I will try to cover this point in my lecture. Uh, I will give a small introduction about the disease and the diagnosis of COVID-19 and um, the different radiological diagnosis. I will um, discuss a little bit of uh, basic anatomy and some basic terms and um, findings in uh, chest X-ray and CT and uh, a couple of differential diagnoses and some pitfalls to take care of. And I will um, give you uh, also a hint about standard uh, reporting uh, in COVID-19. And um, at last, I will discuss uh, the recommendation from the Fleischner Society, which was published a couple of days ago concerning uh, imaging in uh, COVID-19. Excuse me, dear Dr. Muhammad, can you maximize yes. your presentation uh, to be uh, full screen? Okay. Uh, From your PowerPoint uh, presentation? It is already the whole screen or you just, you don't see the whole screen or? Uh... No, we, we see the, we see a minimized view. Okay. You can close the column on the right. Okay. Uh, you mean the column? Uh, yes. Yes, now. Okay. And, uh, ah, okay. And. You can choose from the screen from uh, the column on the right side. I don't understand. I, uh, you are, you are seeing right now the, the presentation, the whole screen. Or you do? We now you are seeing? Yes, yes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Okay. I'm sorry. Uh, okay. And uh, yes, introduction. Um, at uh, the end of uh, December uh, 29, uh, a couple of uh, pneumonia, a couple of cases with um, pneumonia was uh, from unidentified origin was emerged in Wuhan in, in China, and uh, we reported to WHO. And uh, by January, uh, uh, it was um, uh, confirmed that the origin of this pneumonia was uh, the um, COVID-19 virus, the new coronavirus disease. And at uh, the end of January, uh, January um, the WHO has declared as a, a ban endemic. Um, until now, uh, as I checked as, uh, um, the statistic, um, Today, in uh, the early morning, it was more than 2 million people uh, of confirmed disease. And uh, the total uh, disease was um, about 143,000 uh, in more than 200 countries. And in Germany, we have more than uh, 137,000 cases. And so this is, uh, this is uh, are about uh, 4,000. Diagnosis of COVID-19, uh, we have, of course, um, clinical presentation. Uh, we have the common presentation as fever, dry cough, fatigue, and dyspnea. We have less common presentations as uh, um, myalgia, arthralgia, headaches, sore throat. Of course, we have the physical examination. It's done by clinicians in the hospital or the, in the emergency room. We have radiological findings uh, like chest X-ray and CT. And we have also laboratory tests. And um, uh, we all know currently the gold standard is uh, RT-PCR. Um, but it uh, has sensitivity is variable from about 60 to 
but its uh, specificity is uh, extremely high. Um, before um, we go to the radiological findings, we have to discuss some basic anatomical consideration. Um, the basic unit, uh, the basic anatomic unit of uh, the pulmonary structure and function is the secondary pulmonary lobule. Um, the secondary pulmonary nodules, uh, lobule um, consists of um, about uh, five to 15 pulmonary acini that contains alveoli and uh, in which the gas exchange uh, happens. And uh, it's very important to know that um, in the middle of the uh, secondary pulmonary nodules runs uh, the artery and the bronchiole. And in the margin or in the septum runs the lymphatic drainage. And uh, we take a look at this uh, uh, radiograph here. We can see clearly. Yeah, Muhammad, we, uh, we see a fixed slide. We don't see uh, your presentation uh, adequately. I don't know. Uh, but the, the connection is very good at me. Yeah, right. I, I think you can, you can co co uh, complete your presentation as it is. Uh, no, no need to maximize because okay. uh, I think that presenter view is fixed uh, at your uh, ah. desktop. OK, OK. Uh, so you don't uh, you didn't see any slides before yes. or what uh, didn't from the see beginning? This, uh, this slide, uh, starting from the introduction, we don't see. Ah, okay, okay. Uh, this was a number of cases, um, and this was a diagnosis scheme, and this was the uh, secondary pulmonary lobule, as I said, uh, which is the basic anatomic unit of the pulmonary structure and function, and is about one to two uh, centimeter in diameter and contains about five to 15 pulmonary SNI. And as I said, the artery and the bronchiole runs in the middle and uh, the lymphatic and the veins runs in the septum. Um, here is a magnified look at the uh, secondary pulmonary lobule. And we can see here is with the uh, arrowheads is a uh, septum and inside runs the bronchiole and the artery. And there are these SNI, uh, multiple, uh, multiple structures. Um, in order to analyze the pattern in any um, high resolution CT, we, we uh, classify the patterns in two main uh, uh, four patterns, reticular pattern, nodular pattern, uh, pattern associated with high attenu attenuation and uh, pattern with low attenuation. And the, what's important for us today is a pattern with high attenuation, which contains the ground glass opacity and consolidation. Um, um, we have some basic terms to understand uh, in order to analyze a chest CT and X-ray. We have uh, uh, the ground glass opacity, the consolidation, uh, the air bronchogram, and the crazy bathing sign. And we will start with the ground glass opacity. Um, ground glass opacity um, is a term uh, introduced by Fleischner Society at uh, about uh, 2000 uh, or 1995. Uh, approximately, and it is non-specific term, and is uh, is just referred to an hazy increase in opacity of the lung, uh, like we see in this uh, CT scan, uh, with preservation of bronchial and vascular margin, and is caused by uh, partial filling of uh, air spaces, uh, or um, interstitial thickening due to fluid cells or on any other tissues, and also. Uh, partial collapse of the alveoli and or a combination of both. Here is um, a pathological uh, review uh, of uh, what happens exactly in the uh, uh, cells of the lung um, when infected with coronavirus. Here we can see the uh, type 1 and type 2 uh, pneumocytes and we can see the alveolar macrophage and here is a lung surfactant. As the virus comes to the cell, um, it, um, it uh, will uh, be um, attacked with the immune system. Uh, with the time, uh, it uh, will be begin to fill with um, either uh, exudate. And uh, at the end, it will be uh, completely filled. And uh, that's what uh, uh, is uh, um, 
causing the ground glass opacity. Um, the ground glass opacity, as I said, is non-specific. It can occur with, with many diseases, either acute or chronic. We have a large list of, um, of differential diagnosis of ground glass opacity. Um, and um, if we look uh, at the housing field units of the lung, we can see the air is about uh, minus 1,000 uh, with ground glass opacity is uh, extremely variable, ranging from minus uh, 800 to minus 100. And in uh, some stages, it can uh, uh, convert into a consolidation, which is a higher density with uh, loss of uh, bronchovascular uh, margin. Um, the second term is consolidation. And it is an exudate or other product of disease that uh, replaces the air in the alveoli and uh, rendering the lung solid. Um, it appears that as a homogeneous increase in pulmonary parenchyma attenuation that obscures the margin of the vessel and airway. And it can be associated with air bronchogram. As we can see here, this uh, air inside the uh, uh, bronchiole and the uh, over a large area of consolidation. Uh, air bronchogram to describe it is a pattern of air filled, low attenuation bronchi on a background uh, of oblique airless lung. Uh, it is due to uh, the patency of the proximal airway and the evacuation of alveolar air, either due to absorption, due to atelectasis, or replacement due to pneumonia or a combination of both processes. Um, which modality is better uh, in diagnosis or helpful in diagnosis of COVID-19? Is chest X-ray or CT? Uh, chest X-ray is insensitive uh, if the patient has only mild symptoms or an early stage where he has no symptoms at all. Um, but um, when we discuss the uh, effectiveness of chest X-ray, it is uh, extremely um, uh, different uh, according to the health system. Uh, if we take an example like uh, what happened in Wuhan in China, they have advised the patient to go early to the hospital to check if they have coronavirus. So there, a lot of people uh, have went to the hospital, so they got an x-ray, so most of them was normal. And um, if we compare this to what happened, uh, for example, in, in New York City, in USA, they we advised the patient to stay at home until they are um, they have advanced symptom and or they are unstable, so they are come to the uh, emergency room. So most of chest X-rays were was abnormal in this time, um, but chest X-ray can play a great full, a great role in assessing the disease progression or to exclude other differential diagnoses. We'll take a look uh, at this uh, example. This is a patient uh, who already have uh, typical symptoms um, and the chest X-ray appeals com appears completely normal. Uh, a, a CT scan was done uh, one, one uh, hour later and uh, we can see this ground glass opacity in the uh, right lower loop. Another example, uh, but this uh, case is uh, a patient with uh, um, chest pain, cough, and fever since a couple of uh, uh, days, and he is diagnosed with uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, and we can see the extreme uh, uh, distribution of ground glass opacity. The patient is intubated. This is day one after diagnosis, and after uh, three days, we can see the patient have developed uh, an ARDS and the patient died uh, elf days later. Uh, here we see another example of uh, in where um, chest X-ray can, uh, can uh, diagnose uh, ground glass opacities. We can see in the right upper loop and the left lower loop. Um, then we will discuss now the typical findings in uh, COVID-19. We have, as we said, ground glass opacity and consolidation, occasionally uh, what is called crazy paving. Uh, this ground glass opacity, uh, mostly patchy, 
bilateral, sometimes can be unilateral, but is rare, and have predominant to be basal in the lungs and in the peripheral areas, having the morphology of about uh, frowned or nodular in about 50% of cases. Uh, here, um, a statistic of uh, the common pattern and distribution in initial CT uh, of about uh, 990 patients is coronavirus. And we can see bilateral involvement was about 70, um, 78 uh, percent, 87%. And peripheral distribution about 76, posterior involvement 80%, multi-lobal multi involvement about 78% uh, and crown glass opacification, as we said, uh, nearly 90% and consolidation 30%. Um, I will jump this slide. Um, we have also some atypical findings, as we said, typical findings. We have also some atypical findings like mediastinal lymphadenopathy. We have pleural effusion sometimes as a complication of superimposed uh, other infection. Um, multiple small nodules is uncommon to see. Pneumothorax or cavitation, they are all, uh, all atypical findings. Uh, in an uh, interesting study from China, they have uh, um, classified the stages of um, coronavirus disease in two five stages. Um, ultra early stage, uh, which is uh, one to two weeks after exposure. Um, uh, and early stage about one to, two, three day, uh, one to three days after clinical presentation and rapid progression stage uh, from day three to day seven of symptomatic presentation. Consolidation, consolidation stage seven to 14 days of symptomatic presentation and dissipation, dissipation stage roughly two to three weeks after onset. We'll discuss every stage in details. The ultra early stage, usually the patient is asymptomatic uh, one to two weeks after exposure. In this stage, he, will, he can be, uh, he can have um, negative laboratory test by, but a positive throat swab um, CT finding shows um, single, double, or multiple focal ground glass obesities, uh, patchy consolidative uh, obesities, pulmonary nodules encircled by ground glass obesity, and air bronchogram. As we see here, these three examples here, um, peripheral, uh, basal, uh, ground glass obesity in the right lower loop. We can see his small ground glass obesity, patchy, and also we can see here a consolidation the middle loop. The second stage is one to, two uh, one to three days after clinical presentation. Uh, it shows single or uh, multiple scattered batchy or agglomerated ground glass obesities. They are sometimes separated by honeycomb-like or git-like thickened uh, of interlobular septum. And we can see here these examples bilateral uh, distributed ground glass obesities in both lungs. Third stage is the rapid progression stage, which uh, happens from day three to day seven of symptomatic presentations. And in the finding are large light consolidation and air bronchogram. As we can see here, these two examples. The fourth uh, stage is consolidation stage from seven to 14 days of symptomatic presentation. And the CT findings are reduction of the density and size of the consolidative obesities may have been seen. Here we see a large uh, consolidation uh, and another one with the uh, other one in the posterior uh, part. Um, the last stage is dissipation stage and it roughly takes two to three weeks after onset of symptoms. And uh, in this stage, the range of lesions is further reduced. The batchy consolidation or strip-like obesity, which represents fibrosis, um, grid-like thickening of the interlobular septum uh, thickening. Um, I have found an interesting uh, article about uh, the, the use of uh, deep learning uh, 
to assist the uh, uh, lung uh, in um, coronavirus disease and uh, they have used uh, a deep learning uh, quantitative CT pipeline and uh, in different stages or in different uh, uh, serial uh, CT scans here starting from uh, uh, January and then after four days in it's February and seven days and uh, we can see here how uh, they assess the volume of these lesions in different stages. And here as well, they make a uh, volumetric uh, rendering of these uh, lesions to assist the, uh, the size of the lesions. Uh, concerning the comparison of sensitivity of uh, CT uh, to PCR, there, ha there are a couple of publications uh, which have uh, uh, different uh, types of uh, percentage. Uh, for example, in this study, they have uh, 51 patients and the sensitivity of the initial uh, PCR was about 71, uh, 71%. And the sensitivity of the initial CT was 90, 80, uh, nine, uh, 98%. And but uh, we have to say this, uh, this sensitivity doesn't mean they the know exactly that it was a COVID-19. They, they, they mean the lung have uh, uh, something abnormal. It can be a virus pneumonia or other differential diagnosis. And um, only 72% of the patients have typical CT findings. The other study was about uh, 121 patients. Uh, from which 120 were positive after PCR. Um, the normal CT scans in the first two days after symptoms was 50, uh, 56%. Per, uh, percent. And um, from three to five days, well, only 9% only of patients uh, have normal CT. And after uh, six to 12 days, only 4% have normal CT scan. The last study, was uh, about uh, 167 patients in which 3% uh, have initially a negative PCR, although the CT was positive, but the second PCR has confirmed the infection with COVID-19 and in only 4%, um, the initial CT was negative, although the PCR was positive. We have to think also about the differential diagnosis uh, like other types of viral pneumonia influenza virus adenovirus uh, sars or other types of uh, bacterial pneumonia or non-infectious disease we have to take them all, all in consideration i will show a couple of differential diagnosis like this example of pneumocystis carini we see uh, extensively bilaterally ground glass of Bastis in both lungs in a patient with HIV. The second differential diagnosis, pulmonary edema, which is a patient with congestive heart failure. We have uh, with this uh, extensive um, centrally distributed ground glass opacity with a sparing of the subpleural areas. When this is something is uh, others than uh, COVID-19, which prefer to be in the peripheral areas. And we see also the cryptogenic uh, organizing pneumonia in which the, uh, this patient has recurrent pneumonia. We ha has multiple obesities with characteristic, uh, characteristically peripheral distribution bilaterally. There are some uh, pitfalls. Uh, for example, if the patient uh, moves or take uh, breath during the CT scan. This can mimic uh, ground glass opacities uh, or something called pseudo ground glass opacity or the pseudo bronchiectasis. Or if the patient has a previous uh, vascular uh, disease like um, acute or chronic pulmonary thromboembolic disease, this will alter the appearance of the lung and we will uh, see this mosaic attenuation or mosaic perfusion in which there's uh, geographic areas of uh, lung attenuation with other areas of the reduced attenuation. Um, the standard reporting in COVID-19 uh, is very interesting to look at this website. I will share it also at the end of the lecture. 
um, he uh, offers a free template to standard reporting and he, there is a different language, not also uh, not uh, only this language, but uh, maybe 10 languages, which uh, we can use. Uh, it will start asking us uh, about the city protocol, which protocol did we have? If we have a full dose or low dose, did we have contrast metal, uh, contrast media, or we have, we can also um, uh, put some medical, uh, clinical information. Then we can type uh, since first uh, type day, since first uh, symptoms, and we can also select the symptoms. We can also select the admission status uh, if the patient comes to emergency room or ICU. And we can choose from the findings, which findings is present, ground glass, consolidation, crazy bathing. And we can also the additional findings, which is uh, these atypical findings. Um, then we can also comment on the distribution of the obesities. Uh, and the multiplicity of the obesities. Uh, we can calculate a CT score uh, according to severity uh, in which we can um, uh, assess uh, how many percent of each loop is affected. Like uh, if we take roughly the uh, right lower loop, right, mid, uh, right upper loop or the other loops, then we can also uh, uh, Select Dr. The, Muhammad, uh, we have only five minutes, please. Okay, okay, I'm about to finish. <laughs> I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. um, These uh, incidental findings, and we can uh, have this classification of CORATS classification, uh, which um, varies from uh, uh, CORAT ions very low when no CT abnormalities uh, is uh, consistent with COVID to the CORAT6, which, uh, which is uh, PCR, uh, has proven the uh, COVID-19. Um, uh, what is the role of CT scanning uh, for the diagnosis of uh, COVID-19? The American College of Radiologists has said that generally the finding on chest images are not specific and uh, overlap with other infectious infections like uh, influenza, H1N1, SARS, and MERS. Also, the Society of Thoracic Radiology had uh, recommended that CT should not be used to screen for as a first line test to diagnose COVID-19, but should be used sparingly and is uh, reserved for hospitalized symptomatic patients with specific clinical indications. Also in the uh, recent uh, article from the uh, uh, Fleischner uh, Society, they have uh, also confirmed this as imaging is not indicated when the patient uh, is suspected to have COVID-19 has only mild clinical features unless the patient had a risk for disease progression. And um, imaging is indicated if the patient have COVID-19 and uh, have worsening the respiratory status. But if uh, the resources are limited, uh, and we don't have, for example, enough tests, so we can use uh, um, uh, CT as a triage of patients with suspected COVID to, in order to, uh, to decide if they will be isolated or just uh, be normal. Uh, take home messages. Uh, infections uh, with COVID-19 produce acute lung injury, manifesting as predominantly patchy bilateral basal uh, GGO uh, and consolidation. Evolution and self-limited course in large majority of patients with organizing pneumonia pattern. Um, RT-PCR is current test, uh, testing gold standard. Uh, after two days of symptoms, CT exhibits good sensitivity uh, but uh, the specificity is variable and can be improved with radiologists in training. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you so much, Dr. Muhammad, for this excellent presentation. I have a question, please. Okay. Um, in Egypt, um, we have a protocol in, in most hospitals. They don't admit any patient except after doing some sort of chest imaging in the ER 
even if the patient is asymptomatic for the fear of COVID-19. Even in patient with ST elevation myocardial infarction, they don't take the patient for the cath lab except after obtaining at least chest X-ray and in some private hospital, CT chest with a subsequent delay in the reperfusion and subsequent myocardial loss. What do you think about this strategy? I have uh, also uh, some sort of um, similar experience here in Germany. I, I know the, the guidelines and the recommendations say something, but in some hospital, they, they may, um, because of the, the distribution of disease nowadays, they even for every patient now, they go to the hospital and with has cough and fever, even if he has no contact with uh, infected COVID-19 patient, they, they order from the beginning, most of them order CT. And uh, uh, we argue every day of if this is indicated or nothing, but you know, this is uh, a crisis right now in Germany and the routine examinations done every day, radiologic examination have reduced to the, uh, the minimal. So we have capacity to do so, but of course it, uh, it makes... Okay. Yes, yes. And also it has a problem that we have to, uh, if the patient coming, even if extremely impossible, we have to, uh, the, the technician have to um, make the infections control, uh, the infections, uh, just uh, you have to, uh, everything have to be cleaned. Probably after this examination has to do is equipment. And this, uh, it takes a lot of time if we do a CT scan for every uh, patient with just mild symptoms, yes, you know, it's a great burden. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, you said that the, the, the CT show a good sensitivity after two days from symptoms. Yes. So um, I think is a routine uh, asking for uh, the CT, even if the patient is asymptomatic, will uh, will not be cost effective at all. And, yes. Um, uh, I think um, uh, maximally we can uh, ask for uh, chest X-ray. Yes, 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 yes. I, I totally agree. Yes, I. Uh, okay. it's, 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 it's first two days, uh, most of the patient will have uh, no. It will uh, be uh, negative. Yes, yes. In most yes. cases, yes. yes. Uh, Doctor Abdullah Maghrabi, can we uh, have your uh, questions from the audience, please? Yeah, there is a question. Uh, he's uh, asking about. Um, and I'll turn another alternative imaging tool that can detect lung pathology due to coronavirus in the early stages before CT chest signs appear, like VQ scan or PET scan or MRI? Um, actually, I don't have personal experience, but uh, I, have, I have read that maybe they are uh, thinking about ultrasound of the lung, but... Uh, but uh, I think it is uh, it's difficult uh, and it needs a good training and it's operator dependent, you know, but um, I don't have personal experience with uh, PET-CT. Uh, next Sunday, we will have a, a great lecture about uh, basics of lung ultrasound by Dr. Hadim Suleiman from UK. I think uh, we should ask him uh, this question also. Yes, yes. Okay, thank you. Dr. Abdullah, other questions, please? Yeah, I think there is another question, but I think it is incomplete from Dr. El Farhi. Not to lose time waiting for CT and losing time in cath lab. My boss told me to thrombolize uh, even if we have chronography. I, I think he's thinking about uh, STEMI, not not. Uh, mm. Yes, yes. Uh, he, I think he is talking about. Uh, the unnecessary delay uh, uh, of uh, yeah. in patients. Another question is also comparing ultrasound lung uh, versus mm -hmm. CT chest. Yes, we will uh, We will ask this question for Dr. Uh, Hatem Suleiman. I think uh, the, the main problem of uh, lung ultrasound is lack of uh, the well-trained operators and uh, lack of experience in many centers. Uh, I think CT chest uh, is um, is more available in in all hospitals. So practically speaking, uh, CT will be the standard test, 
as regard the uh, chest imaging uh, if lung ultrasound is present i think it will be great uh, and uh, we will enjoy the lecture by dr hatem Suleiman next sunday about this topic also there is another question from dr muhammad ibrahim here and from dr shadi uh, the first one you can you can see in the chat uh, do you see the CT findings from the radiological point of view in non-contrast CT resembling pulmonary infarcts. Yes, it, it can it can uh, pulmonary infarction may may cause consolidation and uh, yeah. it it will be the similar. But if we don't have contrast metal uh, contrast medium injected, then we will we will not know. But I think with pulmonary infarction, it will be a solitary lesion or maximal two lesions. You know, it will not be multiple uh, diffuse in both lines. Yeah. Maybe it's a uh, the point to differentiate from. I want to ask a question here, please. Uh, did you see uh, a mixed cases of uh, pulmonary embolism and the COVID nineteen in your series? I have, um, I, I have, I have a patient which was uh, was brought to the city uh, with suspected lung embolism. Then he have a typical COVID finding, but he didn't have pulmonary embolism. But it happened two times, which other diagnosis was suspected. The patient uh, didn't don't didn't have fever as one uh, expected, and uh, we were um, surprised that he has uh, typical findings, and the test was positive after this. Great, but you didn't see uh, a thrombus in the pulmonary arteries in the COVID positive patients. No, no, I didn't see. Okay, uh, I think it is uh, rather a microthrombi that didn't appear in the CT pulmonary angiography. This is one of the postulation or the uh, uh, theories behind the pathogenesis of uh, COVID lung affection. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Any other questions, dear Dr. Abdullah? Yeah, from Dr. Shadi, he uh, is saying that he has uh, uh, observed uh, from the cases uh, that the right side is more affected than the left. Have you noticed such uh, a thing? No, no. Oh, and regarding uh, and also, the follow-up of confirmed cases by imaging, you do you, you do yes. follow up by chest X-ray or CT chest? Uh, we do we do chest X-rays only CT in in severely patient with uh, when the patient is intubated in the ICU and the the, the they thinking he is not getting better and uh, they do chest CT to to know the extension of the disease. Yeah, uh, especially in some patients, the the the. They, did, they go quickly from a couple of ground glass opacities to extremely ARDS in a couple of days. So, uh, yes, but, but CT follow-up is not, the, the, is not uh, the standard, but uh, in some cases, okay. yes. Okay. So a final question. Uh, do you recommend the CT Anju by Dr. Ahmed Mansour? Uh, no, no. We we do in most of cases uh, low dose CT uh, chest. Yes. Right. Of course, CT. Of course, and you will will help with other pathology. But um, uh, as we said, um, they uh, they send the patient with suspected COVID. They don't uh, they don't need the contrast uh, medium. Uh, they just do low dose and uh, uh, CT. Mm. Okay, Great. I have a question, please. If the patient has renal impairment. Hmm. Can we use uh, MRI chest instead of CT with contrast, or we can use CT without contrast, or what do you do? Uh, in case of pulmonary embolism, you, uh, you mean? No, uh, co a suspected yeah. COVID and COVID. renal impairment. Uh, then we, we will not give uh, contrast medium. Uh, we will not and give this contrast medium. Will not affect the, the sensitivity of the CT chest? No, no, it, it doesn't affect. It doesn't okay, and we can replace it with CT without contrast. Yes, yes, we can do non uh, enhanced CT. Great. Great. Thank you so much. Any Thank other you. question, Dr. Abdullah? No, that's all. Thank you so much, dear uh, Dr. Muhammad. Uh, at the end of the day, I'd like to uh, thank all my uh, friends. Uh, Dr. Ahmad Zahra and Dr. Mariam Fathi and Dr. Mohammed Nu'man and my dear friends, the moderator of the session, uh, Dr. Mohammed Hamdi and Dr. Abdullah Al Maghrabi. And uh, we will uh, continue our uh, webinar tomorrow at the same time <coughs> with uh, three uh, lectures. And we are waiting for all of you.
Thank you so much.